do you believe after coming back from that experience uh, the self exist like you as an individual exist your identity is a little ego group of cells inside of that left hemisphere and and um when they're gone they're gone and they're about the size of a peanut um each of these different parts of our brain resonate in certain frequencies it sounds woo woo but Honest to gosh, we are woo woo. We are by definition the product of woo woo. If you don't like the words woo woo, then come up with quantum physics. Doesn't that sound a whole lot more sophisticated? What is this game called humans that we are all playing? Are you a group of cells? Are you a group of atoms that are mostly empty space or are you an illusion created by the brain? Whatever the answer is, the experience that you are having now is nothing short of magical. Today on Seekers Mind Talks, our guest is a Harvard-trained neuroscientist, Dr. Jill Taylor. At age 36, she had a rather odd experience. She had a stroke in the left rational part of her brain that left her looking at the world firsthand without any concepts or labels. We can only imagine that. But that's an experience worth listening to and understanding. Tune in to Dr. Jill on the Seekers Mind Talks the science and spiritual podcast. Yeah, I do this podcast so that uh, I can expand my consciousness and hopefully inspire other people in the process. And uh talking to you is a kind of spiritual honor because uh not many people have had the experience you've had and certainly in some cultures they see that people who've gone to near death then come back they compare them as to god and um for people to have context can we start with uh, the day of your experience briefly go through that day yes yeah so i was uh 37 years old uh it was december 10 1996 i know you're all doing math right now And uh I woke up I was teaching I had been teaching and performing Harvard uh research at Harvard I specialize in anatomy neuroanatomy anatomy of the brain and uh I woke up what that morning and I I was uh experiencing a major hemorrhage in the left half of my brain and over the course of 4 hours I watched my own brain through the eyes of a scientist. Uh I watched my circuits go offline one at a time uh to the point where I could not walk, talk, read, write or recall any of my life. And uh I I that's that's where I was and um yeah, that's where I went. Yeah, certainly that was a life-changing day for you and uh many people know you by the TED talk that you did that gained the millions of views and where you explained the whole experience more elaborately and uh one line clicked that in me and uh you were saying you were lying in the ambulance and you said the words like you were not the choreographer you you understood that you were not the choreographer of your life what what did you mean by that there that got me ticking oh, well- Up until that moment I had this this experience of um I mean I knew I was having a stroke uh by that point I had self diagnosed that I I had had a stroke uh and and I think that and you know my brain said wow this is so cool so I wasn't I didn't have that same sense of urgency that perhaps a normal person who didn't know what was going on might have. Um but I I had to figure out how to get help and uh, yes the TED talk takes you moment by moment step by step through that process of the morning of the stroke. Uh and then I'm in the ambulance and uh, you know a part of me was just this little voice inside saying hold on. hold on just hold on go slow slow everything down breathe slowly um i felt that if i overexerted or i gave myself high blood pressure uh or turned on my stress circuitry that i would bleed out uh and i was already bleeding out <laughs> so i i had to slow everything down and 
And I was aware of this consciousness of hold on, hold on. And then I realized that I let go. And uh, that's what happened as I was, as we were approaching, we, we were in the ambulance and I was just outside of the emergency room and I felt my spirit surrender is the best language I can place on what that feeling was like when I said I, I wasn't holding on anymore. I, I let go and, and what would be would be. Hmm. Did you had any spiritual experience? Well, I, I think that depends on how one defines spiritual. Um, I think that the experience was a spiritual experience. Uh, as I shifted away from this consciousness of this body and found myself at the far end of a thread, if you will, a uh, million miles away from this body and the ability to get this body to move, but I was still tethered to the body. I wasn't here and I wasn't there. To me, mm -hmm. that was a spiritual moment. Did I see others? No. Did I ha see the white light? No. I didn't have any of the typical near-death experience experiences and uh that that just wasn't that wasn't how it was for me how how did the scientist in you react to that sort of experience which i assume you were not able to define well i was excited because it gave me an insight into you know all this book learning that i had done i mean i had So I had studied the cerebral cortex of the human brain. This was my area of expertise, how our brain uh, creates our perception of reality. This was my area of ex expertise. So, so when I lost the left hemisphere, what I gained was a real insight into what does that mean at the level of these cells? And if we lose the l structure of the left hemisphere and its dominance over the right hemisphere, and now all I have is a right hemisphere because the left hemisphere is swimming in a pool of blood, then what does that, what does that feel like? What does that, what is that, what's going on over there? What, what was still there for me? And the magnificence of the experience of the right hemisphere was this incredible insight into a total expansiveness of me where I had no beginning and no end. And I was this big ball of energy connected to all the energy around and of everyone and no longer defined by the boundaries of the body because I have to have a left hemisphere that, ex that you know, per has perfected that. So, so I was excited. <laughs> Thank goodness. And, and, and you say from your experience that uh, you left that sort of a state and you choose to come back to this state to have a message to the world. What did, what, what did you mean by that? <laughs> I didn't just go from there to here. Uh, it was eight years of recovering all the abilities that I had lost that morning. So I lost language. Well, what does that mean? Language is a ability of us to create a sound and, and then a group of cells places meaning on that sound. And then that meaning gets associated with other sounds and then it gets a, a, a semantics of language and syntax of language and all, I mean, it's so complex. The left brain and what it does with language, just the creation of language is a very complex structure. So it took a long time for me to figure out how to get that to go. Um, and then, and to build a vocabulary and then to build a world knowledge again, based on, on reality and the external world, as opposed to this, this world of infinite 
knowing this that I'd gained in the right hemisphere. So, so it was, uh, it was a process. It was a, a moment by moment, day by day, night by night, constant uh, process of learning. Uh, so it was eight years before I gained the boundaries of where I begin and end. How, how do I know that, that this face is mine, this nose is mine, but these glasses that sit on my nose are not of me? How, how do we even know that? And so there was a, just volumes and volumes of learning that had to happen before I could say, okay, I can do both now. I can do what I have gained and now I can do what I used to be able to do skill set wise, but I wasn't interested in that character, that personality profile of that left hand brain taking over and dominating me at a value structure. Wow. Uh, wow. What did you mean by that? Did you, um, so did you used to think that your spectacles were you, a part of you, including the table, the chair, everything? No, I didn't think any of it was me. None oh. of it, not even me was me. Oh my. So not, what does that feel like? That feels, it feels like, um, what does it feel like? It feels like you're uh, standing on the edge of the ocean and the sun is setting and your whole being from your chest, you just pulls the, all the energy and you expand and become that consciousness of that sunset. Mm -hmm. And the thoughts in your brain, mm, no, they go away. Uh, what you're going to do for dinner mm, goes away. Uh, what size your shoe is mm, goes away. You know, none of that is relevant. All that is relevant is the presence of you, big as the universe in relation to uh, life. And then this awareness that I am alive. I am alive. And in that I am alive is this awe and wonder of the magnificence of everything that has to align itself for me to simply exist here as a life form. Mm. In your talk, you use the word nirvana, if I'm not wrong to describe that feeling. Is it the same? Uh, do you see that to the non-duality that all these Eastern traditions kind of seems to infer to? Yeah. I think so. I think that, you know, I think that when one becomes as big as the universe connected to all that is, then there is nothing other, there, there is no other because everything is a part of this one. And in the non-duality, I think the duality comes in alignment then as the left hemisphere comes online and gives me the other. You know, the interesting thing about being a human is that we, the other is always watching. The other part of us is always listening, whether it's talking to us in a language that we understand or loudly enough that, that we know what the other part of us is thinking. Uh, there's always at least two consciousnesses inside of us as these two major cerebral hemispheres. And regardless of what part of me does in the external world, the other always knows. So, you know, we're really fascinating creatures. After your, after that sort of experience, do you believe the self exists, meaning, uh, I'm uttering these words right now. Is it in my control or is it just that same one being? It's just that you have this self illusion that's being generated by the left brain now. I, I think we're multiple. I think that we have four very specific mm. modules of cells, uh, two that are of the limbic system in our brain, which it acts as a filter of emotion or experience. The right hemisphere is going to be the, the experiential of the present moment. The left hemisphere, these miraculous cells have the power to step out of the consciousness and flow of the present moment and take us back into the past so that it can look and say, hey, I've done this before and it was dangerous, don't do it again. 
uh, so that we have the capacity to learn. Because in order for us to learn, we have to be able to refer back to a knowing, a lesson. Um, and so we end up with these two very different ways of processing emotion and experience. And then we have higher cognitive thinking, very different between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. So, so I think it all depends on as you relate to yourself, to a specific action or ability, then that is one of yourselves. I think that we all have four uh, anatomically, neuroanatomically. So, um, so that's a complex question. <laughs> so you're meaning to say that in some way we all have uh, multiple personality disorders? No, I did not no? say the word disorder. <laughs> what okay. I said, well, because, because multiple personality disorder is not just having multiple personalities. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you know that let's say, uh, let's say, uh, do you have any children? Uh, no. No. Not okay. Yet. Well, let's say you do. Let's say mm -hmm. you, you have uh, um, a little girl and um, she looks just like her mother. All right. Just like her mother, spitting image of her mother. And your little girl comes running in and um, says, Daddy, and you're looking at your little girl and you're going, oh, honey. Right. You immediately move into your compassion. Honey, what? What's going on? Come here. Let me let me pick you up. Let me hold you. And, and that's a part of you. That's one of your ways of being emotionally. And then let's say uh, your wife comes in and she is madder than hell. And she is madder than hell and she's spitting mad and she's throwing stuff around and she's slashing out at you and you're like, 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 you know, back up, back up. Let me out of here. Right. Let me, let me run. Whatever's going on, honey. I, I got to go to the, I got to go get, go to the store. So this is a different part of you. This is a different way for you to interact with the exact same situation because, you know, just because she's bigger and, 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 can, uh, you know, is different, we can have the exact same experience in response from the ex to the external world in different ways. Well, this is normal and natural for us. Uh, multiple personality disorder is a disorder where you can have many different personalities and most of them don't even know about one another. And mm -hmm. they, 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 they don't relate to one another. They don't uh, process information as one in relationship with one another. They're kind of, I'm this, or then this personality can come in, or this personality can come in. And it's a disorder that is generally provoked by in, intense trauma, uh, childhood trauma. So those are two very different things. What I'm saying is we have four different groups of cells inside of our brain. Two emotional limbic tissue, and two cognitive. And each of those groups of cells manifest very specific skill sets. And it just so happens that those skill sets package together and end up looking like very specific personalities. And we can get to know each of those four very specific personalities so that we can actually have conversation and negotiation between them so that we don't have ever experience any personal conflict. And we can do that because we can become aware of these different levels of mindset and bring them together in a peaceful resolution. Hmm. Uh, you roughly uh, describe these four uh, four areas of the brain in your book, Whole Brain Living, and uh, a lot of content of what it is. It's it's already out there. The subtler point I wanted to add is that we all have that tiny voices of different emotions speaking within us, and you have this. Uh, uh, was it brain framework to work around this? Brain huddle. Can, uh, the brain brain huddle. huddle. Yeah, yeah. Brain yeah. huddle. Sorry. Yeah. Can you can can we go? Exp you explain that with an example, maybe. Uh, uh, let's say I want to set a goal, a long-term goal in my life. Uh, how how would I use that? Well, okay. So let's say I want to uh, become a good pianist. I want to learn how to play the piano, right? Um, and so um, a part of my brain is going to be really good at getting me to the the piano to sit my butt down, set the clock so that I'm there. Um, and it's going to look at the, it's going to learn how to, 
uh, match the letters of the notes to the different uh, keys. And I'm going to learn, you know, the, I'm going to train myself to understand that. And, um, and so then I can actually teach myself how to play a song, uh, but it might sound pretty bad because I'm just kind of pounding away the nuts, right? So, so that's then a different part of my brain can come online and it can say, well, you know, I'm over here in the right hemisphere and I got rhythm. And uh, if you want to have good music, you might actually want to have a little rhythm. And so I kind of start moving our body. And so I'm moving the body and I've got the rhythm going and I got the beat going. And now I'm like, I'm like engaging myself into the music in a more creative possible way. And, um, uh, you know, and then there's another part of me that's just going to go, this hurts my little finger. I can't get my ring finger to bend like that. It just doesn't hurt. And I, you know, my nails are too long and I don't want to cut my nails. I, 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 I. So there are all these different parts of who we are that are participating in the process of everything that we, we engage in. And knowing, being able to listen to this part that is critical and cranky, to be able to say to that part, honey, I get it completely, but you know, realistically, this is a priority for me because it's so good for our brain. It gets us thinking better and it's like a skill set. And I'd really like to be able to play happy birthday to so-and-so in three weeks. And, and so, you know, let's just do it and we don't have to do it forever. We'll figure it out as we go. So there's this ongoing conversation already happening inside of our heads between these different parts. And what I ask people to do is to actually differentiate, get to know these four different characters that we each have so that we can differentiate who they are. We can get to know them and then we can engage with them directly so that I become a team inside of my head. And when I'm a team inside of my head, then I'm no longer open to uh, reactivity uh, and discomfort and, and, and upset because all of my brain has already had the conversation. Hmm. Uh, a lot of meditative practices also seem to be pointing in the, this direction of uh, being aware of your reactions and uh, being able to point your, uh, your, your mind in the direction of your choosing, right? Yes. Hmm. Uh, yes. Do, yeah. Th that is true. But let me say, let me say this. Most of the, I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry of how do I quiet my left hemisphere so that I can actually have some peace in my heart and enjoy <laughs> myself and expand and feel like I'm big as the universe, right? I mean, that's a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar thing. And what whole brain does, what we gained, what, what the world has gained because I had this stroke through the eyes of a scientist is that now I know where we're going. And I can say to you, here is a personality profile that you have inside of your brain. And a lot of people will say, I don't know that part of me at all. And I'd say, okay, well, do you know this part of you? Left thinking, rational brain, one plus one equals two. What's right? What's wrong? What's good? What's bad? I go to work, a type personality. Yeah, most people can recognize that part of themselves. And do you know your little character uh, of your left emotion? I'm not very unhappy. Uh, this is the pain of your past. Uh, this part blames and screams and and it's uh, uh, it can be vindictive. It can hate. It can do all these things. You know that part of yourself and most people are honest and they say yeah I know that part of myself I'd like to have that one cut out or I went to therapy for 20 years for that part and then there's this other part which is the emotion of the present moment experience well this is the playful open in the present moment oh my gosh I dive into the water and I feel the pr feel the pressure against my face and I feel the temperature and I feel wetness and my dogs get excited because this part of my brain gets excited. Okay. Seriously, that's exactly what happened. Energy. Hey, hey, hey. Goodbye. Sorry about that.
So, so most people know that part of themselves, but the part of themselves that most people struggle to know is where do I find peace? How do I let all that go so that I can sit in the presence of myself in my life and I can just sit in deep gratitude that I exist at all? How do I find that? And part of finding that is knowing this package of characteristics of that part of us and then looking at these other three parts and saying, and how do I use those? and how do they interfere with my ability to find this peace that I'm looking for? Hmm. Especially, I think in the recent decade, it has indeed gone to a multi-million dollar industry meditation and everything, the, pa- the whole package surrounding that. And you, uh, you, you pointed out to a subtle point there, your dogs can sense your inner energy. It's like if you are really nervous and approach a dog, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to be vocal. Your dog can sense that, right? And uh, do you believe after coming back from that experience, uh, the self exists? Like you as an individual exist or is it an illusion? Oh, it's a, it's a group of cells in my left hemisphere. That's all it is. It's a group of cells in my left hemisphere. And then, you know, if a doctor went in and cut those out, I'd be just as non-existent as I was before. And that can be very disturbing to a lot of people. You know, it's like, oh, no, I'm more important than that. You know, (laughs) I'm great. I'm this. I'm the king of all. I'm rich. I'm this. I'm that. It's like, no, your identity is a little ego group of cells inside of that left hemisphere. And and, um, when they're gone, they're gone, and they're about the size of a peanut. So... Uh, you know, we are, because of the way we are structured at the level of our brain, both the center of the universe and uh, stardust. I mean, we're just, you know, it's a group of cells. That's all I am. I am this magnificent collection of cells and, and it's precious and life and our time here is precious. So um, uh, we do have the power to choose who and how we want to be. Uh, to a much higher level than uh, most of us have been taught. Yeah, I saw that on your footnote in your email. Uh, be responsible for the energy you bring out to the world. Yeah, right. Take responsibility. I mean, uh, I mean, you you know when somebody walks in a room, they walk in with their energy. And it's like, Mm -hmm. is that something that's going to attract me? Is it something that is going to make the children go hide underneath the steps? Is it, you know, I mean, take responsibility for the energy you bring. And if you don't like the life you're living, then then, uh, try paying attention to what the life is actually that you are living and Mm -hmm. uh, see if you want to make changes. After your experience, do you believe free will exists? Do I believe what exists? Free will. Free will? Yeah. I believe that free will exists. Hmm. I do. I think I have four choices at any moment in time to embody any of my four characters at any moment in time. I do. I think have I ever, have, have. Have you ever thought whether that is also predetermined? Why would it be? I just don't, <laughs> I, I, I just don't see me as that important. <laughs> for for you know for my existence to be predestined and that just feels like uh way too much ego that i can't wrap myself around no why i ask that question is that can act as ego dissolution if if we get an answer to that yeah not ego boosting yeah well but uh yeah for me, I do. I think we have free will. I think we're making choices. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, do you believe the uh, modern world or the century, so as to say, is getting more left brain? Oh, it is so far skewed to the left. We have mental illness like you can't imagine. I mean, we actually think the external world is real and we think that uh, we don't have any power to choose differently. And I think that part of that is because we don't know what our choices are and we have been really skewed. I think that at an anatomical level, uh, when language came into being a skill set that the human brain would master most humans on the planet, I mean, you know, for centuries, only the priests could read. 
<laughs> and mm -hmm. what that meant was only the priest's brain was capable of of concocting all the millions of details that it had to do in order to have the kind of language that it could master as reading. And and that was a different breed of human. We had we had different values at that time. We were much more in the present moment. Uh, we were um, uh, I don't want to say primitive, but we were we we had to be in the present moment because we were in a more of a survival mode, uh, which is more of a present moment experience. And but as soon as we become much more leisurely, and we're reading, reading actually automatically takes our brain out of the present moment into some other space and time. Whether I'm work cleaning out, working on a form, or I'm uh, uh, reading a, a novel, I'm somewhere else inside of my brain. Um, so, so we are a mutation. I mean, that's the magnificence of being human is that we are in an ongoing state of change. And, and then the question is, you know, what choice do we have as a species to purposely direct our own evolution so that we can actually become more emotionally and mentally stable and healthy as a species in relationship to the planet? And, and will we get there in time? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you connected the left brain to depression. Uh, wh what is the linkage there? To depression? Yeah, you, you said that we are skewed to the left. Uh, you are, we are using more of the left, side, left hemisphere of our brain. And uh, that is inevitably leading to more depression in the current decade. Why, why is that? No, I said mental, uh, lack of mental wellness. Mental okay. illness, not yeah, because this is a decade of uh, you, you. You throw, you sprinkle that word of depression everywhere you go. You see that you open social media, you go out, you see that word everywhere. Yes, you do. Depression. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that. That's because we are using more of our left brain. Well, mental. Our mental health is is a hundred percent dependent on the health and the well being of our brain. And mm -hmm. if we're living in our left hemisphere more time, which we are, and we are comparing, and the, the tool of the left hemisphere takes my internal world and relates me to the external world, right? So it's kind of mm -hmm. like the left brain is the portion of our brain that is social media to the world, because it mm -hmm. is. And so it gives me language. I have to have language to communicate to the external world. It gives me the ability to sort and organize things that I need in the external world. It defines the social norm of what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is bad, which I have to know if I'm going to fit myself into the external world. So the left hemisphere is this tool that we use in order to fit ourselves into the external world. Well, if our right hemisphere has been compromised and I don't walk around with this awe and wonder of, oh my God, I'm alive at all, then that leaves me dependent and we're actually training through social media the brains of our young people to become dependent on the number of ticks and clicks and the approval from the external world. Well, if I live my existence based on the approval of the external world, I will never reach satisfaction. Mm. Because it'll always be fragile. I mean, even if I'm Taylor Swift and I've got 300 million people on my social media, it takes that long for her to fall off that pedestal. And people are already trying to shoot her off that pedestal, right? Mm. So how does she or how do we, the rest of us, how do we maintain our own self-value self and self-worth? And you do essentially, I think Taylor Swift is actually an excellent example because she got shot down so much a few years ago that she pushed herself away from society altogether and, and lived pretty much in isolation for a year. And somewhere in that isolation, she realized this is crap. I am living my life based on the values of other people and I can never satisfy them and they will never be satisfied. So I can either hide or I can come out and be me and then they just got to deal with me like I just got to deal with them. And that is what she has done. And, and um, you know, I think she's done a great job doing that. Hmm. Are there any specific practices where, where, which you can do to balance yourself back? 
Yeah, I think uh, being very careful. Well, first of all, I think the most important thing is you need to know what your choices are. Who are mm-hmm. you? How do I know who are these four parts of who I am? If I want more of some part of me, I need to go and learn about who is that part of me so that I actually know what my goal is. And then I can clearly recognize when I am fulfilling that. And if I'm not being able to find that part of myself, but I know the other parts of me, then I can look at my life and I can say, well, if my left rational thinking, if I'm watching the news all the time and I'm pulling in all these facts and details all the time. How, where is the room in my brain for peace? There is none, not in that part of my brain. It's not by definition a peaceful part of the brain. So you have to be willing to set it aside. Do you have to get rid of it? No. Do you have to manage it? Yes. Do you have to figure out for yourself what does that mean in order for you to be healthy? Yes, it's up to you. So once you know these four different parts of who you are, then you can really figure out how do I find my own balance? And we're all going to find that differently. But what's going on in the real world that I'm engaging with? So me personally, I watch the news 30 minutes a day, period. That's it. I go to a very certain spot, uh, uh, source on YouTube. I get my daily news, I kiss it goodbye, and if I want to listen to something, I might listen to um, uh, something ranging from uh, vibrational frequencies for body healing, because I like it, it's a nice vibration. Um, Each of these different parts of our brain resonate in certain frequencies. It sounds woo-woo, but Honest to gosh, we are woo-woo. We are by definition the product of woo-woo. If you don't like the words woo-woo, then come up with quantum physics. Doesn't that sound a whole lot more sophisticated? But it's the same stuff. So it's a matter of how do I live my life, not your life, and you don't live my life. How do I live my life in a way that I can incorporate the kinds of pieces then bring me my own peace so that I can be the functional human being in the world, spending my time doing the things I want to do. How do I, how do I balance me? Hmm. We're all going to do that individually and differently. How has your life changed after that eight years? Uh, How has it changed Jill as a person? I switched from being a go, 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 left brain, uh, climb the Harvard ladder, uh, want the bigger house, want the more of this, the do, 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 go, go, go. I was at the center of the universe. Uh, I was. I'm not at the center of the universe. Now I care about humanity. And how do I use me as a tool to be able to help other people find more peace so that they too can find more peace and so that we can project out into the world more peacefulness and then maybe the world won't be quite so hateful and we might actually enjoy life. Hmm. Do you think you're going to continue after uh, you die? Well, I think that um, that's a nice question. I think three quarters of me is going to go poof because it's all about the cells. So me, the individual, no, I don't think Joe Bolte Taylor is going to survive death. Uh, but does my, a part of my consciousness, I think that the part of my consciousness that is in the energy that infiltrates 50 trillion cells I think that energy has an affinity for itself and that um, some of my pattern energy systems might flow, but will I be attached to anything going on in this world? I doubt it. Mm. Because I I like science scientists and I like the spiritual path as well and I've done a bit of digging and uh, the most apt definition I got for myself was conscious energy and that is not, do you you believe consciousness is strictly physical and it goes beyond physical and you kind of explained it in the same manner and we are all just conscious energy. Do you believe that consciousness, this experience that we are having is strictly physical? No, I do not. However, I think human consciousness requires Mm -hmm. a human to exist. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. 
We, because I mean, it makes sense. I have to have this machine to have this kind of a consciousness. But if this, if this is gone and all I have is this, is this conscious? Yes. Those cells are still living beings with some form of awareness of self and relationship to others in order to be functional and then get rid of this. And is there still consciousness? Well, is the consciousness actually in the atoms and molecules that make the cells or is it in the DNA or is the consciousness in the energy that manifests the cells? And I'm going to say it's in the energy that manifests the cells. Mm, maybe uh, maybe you, you would have felt this because you defined to me as standing at the edge of the ocean and where your boundaries dissolve. And at some point you might see it as everything sort of happening. Uh, like it, we, science might define it as entropy and where the universe is going and from a state of less or more disorder, right? And uh, you might have felt that it as a maybe, do you feel that everything is like one whole living being and where things are happening and we, we are this momentary specks in between somewhere there? I, I, I think that consciousness is one big thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think everything's connected. You know, I think in order for us to have any kind of, of experience of separateness, we have to have a little group of cells about right there. Hmm. Otherwise, and, it's all perceived as one. Yeah, and our, oh, when I read a little bit, I see that our older cultures, you explained that a little bit earlier as well. The older cultures trend was living more in the right brain and they seems to have intuitively known that the ego or you as a person doesn't actually exist and it's more than yourself but the world tends to be going more and more down that ego path now right i think it, yes and i think that it is however unfair this is where i love eastern uh, medicine i love eastern religions but this is where i have a problem mm -hmm. i don't think one i don't think when I read is Eastern religions, and I'm not an expert on this, but I dabble here and there, and I talk to my friends, right? And I got some pretty interesting friends. I don't think the goal is the absence of ego. I, I, I just don't think that is a functional human being. Mm -hmm. I think the goal is whole brain living. So I don't think it's just right, and I just don't think it's just West. I think that it's this combination of whole and... I think there is wisdom, incredible insights and wisdom that the Western brain can gain from Eastern religions. But as soon as an Eastern culture says to me the goal is no ego, it's like, but is that true? Because if I don't have an ego, I can't be a functional human being. Now, I agree that when I'm dead, I don't need an ego. And that's going to be a different level of consciousness. But if I'm going to be a functional human in this form, on this planet, and I have been given both, I truly believe we're supposed to live as whole brain living, not as Eastern or Western alone. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, what I understood is not doing the things that you ought to do or that you are uh, responsible for, but not just reacting to it and just letting your ego go and just doing the things or uh, I've read in one book, I don't remember, I, th I think it was Vigyan Bhairava Tantra, I don't remember exactly, but it says that, uh, so there is this meditation technique in that, it says that uh, if you if you just concentrate on your breath for 90 days straight, and this is done by rishis apparently, I've not got any specific evidence of people who have done it, but this is there in the book, and if you just concentrate on your breath for continuous 90 days, and I assume now that you get to shift just to your right brain and but what is defined there is that your brain kind of switches to the whole brain living and you see yourself as an actor uh, you you see separate from everything even the things you do even the words that's being uttered from my mouth even my hand being moved even me eating you see that as a separate entity and uh, maybe in that way you re still remain functional right you still you, I mean, because you're, you, you are exactly describing what I became after the stroke. I was still <laughs> conscious, right? Uh -huh. I was still conscious. I had zero ego. I had zero left, left brain skill. But without the left brain skill, I had no language. 
Mm-hmm. I have to have language. And part of language is this, the I am. I think what you're, you're, you're asking us to do is to shift to the value structure of the right hemisphere and assume, mm-hmm. and you don't have to, I don't, I don't, I don't think you have to work that hard. I think, I think it, um, I think it's easier to do what we have been trying to achieve than it has been because we didn't have a roadmap to get there other than get rid of these things. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one thing to get rid of these things, but it's another thing to say, this is what I am. This is what I'm going to embody. This is what I'm going to be. And that falls away naturally because now I'm become, I'm, I'm stepping into this. You understand what I'm trying to say? Exactly. Okay. So, so I, I think that I, I get it completely. I mean, that's how I live my life. I live my life. I spend half my life on a boat out in the middle of nowhere in beautiful Kentucky in a beautiful cove with my dogs and nature. That's how I live. It's magnificent, and I function as I need to function, but I'm, and I am productive, and probably even more productive than I was before, because the left hemisphere wants to make a list, and it wants to set timing for it, and it gets things done when it gets things done, blah, 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 and the right hemisphere doesn't do that. The right hemisphere finds a way to eliminate some of the stuff that's going to get done because it's really not significant, And then it blends it together in a different kind of a way. Mm -hmm. So I understand what you're asking. Um, But to me, that is, that is not, um, to me, when I read, when I have read different Eastern religious lessons, Mm -hmm. the goal has been to let go of the left and to have only the right. Hmm. And, and, and it's been a pretty harsh, I'll give you a typical example. So I was talking to a buddy and we were talking about, okay, the, the, uh, the, the teacher is wherever the teacher is and the student comes in and makes an observation and, or does something and, and because, and that was wrong. He's not ready, right? He's wrong. Uh, still focused on detail. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And and it was the absence of the awareness of one awareness that was the right answer. And and I thought to myself, I understand that if that is the goal, but mm. to me that's not the goal. To me, all of it, both of it, is the goal. And, and I don't know, you know, but who am I? <laughs> you know, uh, that's what I partly said. Like, we still remain functional, right? Yeah. We, are, we are still using the whole brain. So as to say, it's just that, I don't know, that's what I got from it. But yeah. just thought I'll uh, say that to you. And uh, yeah. do you think that's the same thing that's happening when people take psychedelics? No, I think psychedelics, psychedelics... Um, and I'm one of the few people with this opinion, so I'll mm-hmm. put that right out there. Psychedelics stimulate parts of the brain that, in a way that they are not normally stimulated, which is why you have a psychedelic experience. It essentially shuts off the left hemisphere and blasts you out of form into pixels and bits of parts. And there's a hallucinogenic experience and the cellular response at the level of the brain is the same response of the brain to trauma and which is is neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, the creation of some new neurons and uh, rearrangement of cells. So that those are the brain's response to trauma. And so I think what what we're doing is we are purposely creating a trauma at the cellular level of the brain in order to gain an awareness and uh, so that we can look at our lives differently. Um, I recognize the value of doing that once, maybe twice. Past that, 
uh, to me, it's toward its effort toward stepping toward another addiction. And the verification of this is if you go and you look and you read any of the research in the, for the psychedelics, if you, I mean, they're doing some beautifully amazing things with people with, with certain disorders. But when you read the research and you just read the beginning, and it gives you a list of exclusionary or inclusionary lists of things. If you have, if you're an alcoholic, if you've been in drinking alcoholism, alcohol for, you know, within the last, what, month, two weeks or a month, you don't qualify. If you have a loved one who has a severe mental illness, you don't qualify. If you don't A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So it really works out to about 85% of the population. So what that says to me is at the level of the science, this population should, it's dangerous to the brain. And I just think people need to be really wary of what they're doing and why they're doing it and how much of it they're doing uh, when there are other ways for people, I think, to find the same answers. Yeah, forgive me for this, uh, but uh, you said that you are setting your brain into trauma, whereas people, some people who have psychedelic experience, they say that they are out of their trauma. How, how does that work? I well, didn't that's really. Because, that's because their trauma is in the emotional s tissue of the left hemisphere. And mm -hmm. so when you come in and you take a, uh, something like psilocybin and you're going to uh, create a whole new experience, essentially you're taking the energy and, and awareness out of those cells where the emotional, past emotional trauma is. What you're engaging in now is a present moment cellular neuroanatomical trauma for the cells. Do you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? That's so a you're different kind of trauma. exhausting your uh, right hemisphere brain cells. Is that what I'm hearing? No, you are creating trauma. The brain, if, if you have a brain wound, if you get hit mm -hmm. in the head, right, and mm -hmm. you got a brain problem, two things are going to probably happen. One, neurogenesis, you will grow some new neurons into the traumatized tissue. Mm -hmm. And you will have a neuroplasticity, a rearrangement of the cells that are currently there. So mm -hmm. the brain's natural response to a physical trauma is neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Uh, okay. And mm -hmm. that's what the brain's response is to psychedelics. And then, uh, wait, there's more. Uh, the hardest part for what's going on in the psychedelics is if you're doing a hallucinogenic psychedelic, then essentially you're taking a drug and you're saying to your brain, brain, I want you to hallucinate. Well, hallucinating is not a normal function of the human brain. So if you come in and the more you run a circuit, the stronger the circuit becomes and then the circuit begins to run automatically. We have a new epidemic level of people in the States who are, are, have been just smoking pot. We're not even talking the psychedelics because the pot is now a hallucinogenic substance. These people are taking pot, smoking, hallucinating, and then they're becoming officially diagnosed with schizophrenia because their circuitry is not turning off the hallucinogenic. Mm. This is a problem. Mm. This is a neuroanatomical problem. And all of a sudden the pendulum has swung from, oh, these substances are, are horrible. You can't use them to, oh, these are going to fix everybody. And it's like, oh dear Lord, I think we're going to look back in 30 years and go, <laughs> what were we thinking? Some most people uh, they get some sort of therapeutic value from it. I guess that's the reason. But I guess we should learn to people use. Well, I know. <laughs> Not people are. Are you talking about people you know personally? Are you uh, seriously? It's easy to say. Oh, everybody's getting better. It's like no. I can name you twenty people I know because everybody's doing it. Twenty mm -hmm. people I know who are going. 
I didn't really like it. And I didn't like it because of this. And then, or after the fact, I didn't like that I had to go back because it really didn't give me what I needed. I mean, if you're having real one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, I'm not having that same experience that you're having. Mm -hmm. I, I've read reports online that said with continuous repetitive use, you lose all sense of reality. And what you've said seems to be correct. And then people who really want to do it wants to get that sort of uh, spiritual experience that you had during your uh, brain injury or some sort along that line. Right. That's what I... Or, yep. or maybe, maybe, I, I get it. maybe as as with mobile phones and everything, every technology that we have, you learning to use these things as a tool rather than it taking control over you might be. Uh, do neurogenesis happen at any other circumstances other than brain trauma, brain trauma or damage? Development. Oh, okay. Development. So, can we look at it that way also from that viewpoint? No, it's already developed. This is trauma. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. This is trauma. You know, but it's like, um, uh, okay, but let's say uh, uh, we're going to go out, we're going to party, and we're going to drink, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to get drunk. And, well, that's trauma. I mean, that's poison. Alcohol is actual poison to the cells. What I care about is what's actually happening at the level of the cells to mm -hmm. the cells. What is in the best interest of the cells? Because... My mental health is 100% dependent on the health and the well-being of my brain cells. Now, if I can, if I can take a, uh, a, a psychedelic and blast my, myself out of my left hemisphere and all my trauma from the past, and I can break some of the circuits that I've been running in my PTSD, then I understand that. But these people, we're not having them become... I mean, the goal is to not have these people become now dependent on having to do that again. They still have to do therapy in order to uh, create a new level of integration for the recovery if you're actually doing this in the hope of having some kind of a recovery from some kind of an emotional trauma. Hmm. What do you think will have happened if it was the other portion of your brain that got shut down, the right hemisphere, and it was you were solely living on your left one? Well, um, the uh, you know I hear from hundreds and hundreds of people uh, with all kinds of brain trauma, all kinds of mental illnesses, all kinds of uh, neurological anything brain weird brain they contact Jill. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I hang out with interesting people. Um, most of the people I know who have come to me who have said I had the exact same hemorrhage but in the right hemisphere, um, and my biggest complaint is I can't find God. <laughs> I can't find God because that's those are the cells that are actually designed for me to be able to have that experience. And so... They, they just can't find God. So, so I think, um, and, and oftentimes these individuals um, are, are kind of critical of their caregivers. I hear from a lot of caregivers from people who have had right hemisphere trauma uh, mm -hmm. because it's a sense of gratitude. It's all gratitude, wonder. And if I don't have, and if all I have are the details of right and wrong and good and bad and everything you're doing is bad and wrong and nah, 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 that's pretty hard to live inside of. Mm -hmm. Do you believe the brain has this power of telepathy and ESP and that sort of? I think that different people have different levels of those gifts. Absolutely. I think that that these are going to be right hemisphere uh, energetic awarenesses, subtle awarenesses, intuition. Um, and those are very real factors. We're just exacting, you know, we're, we're existing in a society that doesn't really value those things. Instead, we value all these things um, that are very different. Mm, because uh, I had a brain scientist, uh, his name was Jeff, uh, on my show, and he 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 do brain scans and he is um, he looks into all these ESP and people who are telepathic and able to communicate and he was he was telling me something about the God spot in the brain I think it was the right temporal lobe that when when it gets shut down 
uh, you 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 begin to shift into a higher awareness where I, you are able to look into other person's thought and he even give me an example of an autistic child where uh, the child was able to identify so the there was a mother standing next to the child and the mother was opening a book and he was she, uh, she was randomly looking at one word and the child was able to sense what word the mother was looking at and yeah. that kind of baffled me there's all kinds of abilities that people are showing that we just really don't have uh, have not had the tools to figure out how to measure and and evaluate effectively it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen it means just you know but i love it when i hear about scientists who are openly and enthusiastically uh exploring the skills of what's going on inside of the right hemisphere because by definition the scientific method is a method but the right hemisphere doesn't function methodically it mm -hmm. it is an ex explosion of everything at the same moment it's not this linearity uh so uh there's so much that the scientific method can and does and it's fantastic but there's also this you know this collective but functional imaging uh spect uh these tools have have really given us an an opportunity to explore at a new level and it's exciting mm. The brain is exciting. I mean that's why I went into the brain. I knew I'd never be bored. Yeah, I remember reading somewhere when I researched about you that after your experience your work were not being discussed by scientists enough because you are you are a scientist and you had all these experiences and you are able to share that evidence to the world and there seems to be some kind of disconnect or cognitive dissonance happening there between in the science world itself of us expanding. Is that really there? You know, oh, it's terrible. I mean, it, here's a typical. This and this is the one that drives me insane. We have known since I was in school. So I was in school back in the 80s, 70s and 80s. In mm -hmm. the school books, we were we learned that the 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 sleep cycle, the human sleep cycle is anywhere between 90 minutes and 110 minutes. And we learned that um x number of cycles uh are pretty much necessary in order for us to f have a rested brain in order to engage in life day after day after day with enthusiasm and freshness uh, we still wake up still this is 2024 we still wake up patients in the hospital every 60 minutes in order to check their vitals when they are in extreme um uh crisis so every how does that happen you know it's these kinds of misses that that just it's like there's no sense to that it's like we already know if you wake up and if we know that if you wake up these people every hour on the hour for x amount of time they will literally become psychotic i mean it's 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 insane how difficult it is for us to get information fundamental information that is important to the health and the well-being of patients as well as society into society in order for it to become functional so you know i mean it's uh you come up with some kind of a piece of data and you uh submit it to a journal and it doesn't show up even in a journal for 3 years and it's a good 14 to 18 years before it ever finds its way into a book that is going to you know now be taught at a medical school level um information does not move quickly hmm do do you do you see there's a bridge between spirituality and neuroscience Absolutely. And I think people are jumping all over it. I think it is naturally describing itself. Absolutely. Mhm. Mm yeah. Cuz people care. You know, this is uh, uh the question is I think what is spirituality? And you have to ask yourself that. And what does that mean in neuroscience? I mean, how do you take how people define what is spiritual i mean me for example i don't talk about i've i had an ex, a spiritual experience i i had a neurological trauma and in the neurological trauma this is what happened to me 
And every other person on the planet would probably describe that as a spiritual experience. And, and it's like, okay, but I'm a scientist. So, so I can work with that language and I know people are comfortable with that, but mm, that's not how I talk about it because that's just not the frame within which I'm most comfortable. Mm -hmm. But we all know we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. I had a behavioral scientist on my show last episode and he kind of described a same thing in which our brain uh, reacts to certain words, right? So it might be the spirituality that's triggering you, but here you have somebody who's giving oh, a... God. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Uh, I remember uh, somebody defining God as uh, the all the summation of the information that we don't know or the things that we don't know, we don't know yet. Uh, you said you work with a lot of brain people and uh, brain scientists and you've had people contacting you. Have you had any really intriguing and interesting uh, experiences or stories that people shared with you? Oh, uh, on what avenue? <laughs> I mean, we can talk any part of the brain. We can talk about any part of behavior. I mean, that 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 you had you found it hard to believe, but still, somebody was giving it out to you. That I found it hard to believe. No, because I'm mm -hmm. open to possibility. <laughs> but, okay, but, but I I can tell you the ones that that I find most fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, or, or yeah, or that was one in your limit, or like at the yeah. boundary of your. Yeah, um, the savant brain. The savant brain, do you know savant? Savants are people who, like, let's say a guy dives in, a normal dude dives into a pool, and the pool is more shallow than he thought, so he hits his head on the bottom of the pool, and he gets a concussion. Brain trauma, they rush him to the hospital, uh, and all of a sudden he can play the piano and create music and have all these new gifts that he never had at all before, never touched a piano, and now he can actually sit down and play a piano. Wow. I find these people fascinating, fascinating. How does that happen? Because it's like, well, his brain already knew how to do that or did it, and if it did, why couldn't he tap into it? And if it didn't, where did it come from? I mean, it's this. This is this is mind blowing to me. Now, another thing I will say that um, I used to work at a place called the uh, Midwest Proton Radiation Center, and these mm -hmm. were people who came for proton radiation. And protons are are these these little beams, and and you shoot a beam through like a mile of of tubing distance and then it would we'd zap we'd pick where they're going to zap in the brain and the beauty of this is that if it's a tumor and the tumor is this big well you could shoot the size of the tumor and just a little bit around the tumor versus just sending in a big wave and wiping out the whole brain with radiation right so so it's a really beautiful tool to use and and so I was brought in to identify different parts of the brain that they wanted to make sure that they missed with the beam. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you want to miss vision, you want to miss audition, you want to miss taste buds, you want to miss, you know, there are all these things in there that you really do want to miss because it makes a big problem if you don't. So I would go in and I would look at these brains and I would look at these brains and I literally, every time I left, I would cry. I would call my mother this was post-stroke. I'd call my mother and I would cry. And I would say, I, I just, I just, I'm so grateful. I am so grateful that my brain is functioning again because I look at these brains and this trauma and it's like, oh my God. And I would ask these people who I would be sitting with who were the nurses who would take care of these people. And I would say, tell me about this patient because I'm looking at this brain and there's all this destruction in the cranial vault. The brain is just like eaten out, mutilated and big tumors. And I mean, it was just, it was devastating. And I say, what can this person do? Can they walk? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, they walk in all the time. And it's like, it's like, can they talk? 
oh, yeah, 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 they talk to us. And it's like, I mean, can they do this? Can they do that? They're in, and I get these stories of all the things, the abilities of these people with these brains that were so horrible to look at through the eyes of a neuroanatomist. And I would just walk away going, I have no idea how these people are doing what they're doing. I have no idea. It's almost like we really don't know what we're talking about when it comes to neuro, because otherwise it's like, like uh, this does this and this does this and that does this and then, and then if you don't have that, it doesn't do that. And it's like it's not like that. It's so bizarre. I don't know. It's a it's a miracle. The brain, human brain is a miracle. Uh, so in the savant brain that you talked about, so it's like, uh, so he learns the piano. He It's sort of that he already knew, but that that can't happen spontaneously, right? Before you, because our brain learns through repetition, but how can they, that spawn out spontaneously? No idea. I have wow. no idea. I really have no idea. I don't know if, if there's a group of cells in there that have that capacity and... Uh, and somehow or another, it gets now tapped into, and now he has these capacities. I have no real idea about what's going on. And that's why I love these guys who are doing, and women who are doing functional imaging, because it's like, okay, well, has anybody gone and taken him and stuck him in a magnet now and looked at which part of the brain he actually uses and compare that to where the trauma was and have any explanation whatsoever about about what the savantism is how it appeared how you know how, what can we learn about it it's fascinating i mean it's, the the people the brain trauma is really quite a fascinating i mean it's a horrible thing when it interferes with people's lives but it's also quite amazing uh the insights that we can gain yeah, and, and that that person had not learned piano before, right? Never. He never played a piano. Is is that pointing to past lives? I, I have no idea. I can't <laughs> speak to that at all. You know, one of my favorite things about past lives, while we're just chatting, is um, watching on YouTube the children, who mm -hmm. the experiences of uh, of children who are 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 identifying very specific details <laughs> about uh, about their past life or about that, how they died. Yeah, I, I find that, I, I don't know, I have zero answer to any of that stuff. All I know is um, uh, I have a much more open mind than a typical scientist. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> but I'm not, I, in that, I'm not in that world anymore, you know, so I, I don't have to fit in their box anymore. Yeah, I think there's this science by, uh, I'm just checking up the scientist name. Uh, um, have you read the book Many Masters, Many Lives by Dr. Brian Weiss? I think I did. Yeah. Yes, and did. yes, yes. He's the one, he's famous for uh, past lives. Yes, yes, yes. And I've not read the book, but uh, he certainly has evidence of this sort somewhere down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, uh, and that's one of the things I, I love about, you know, the modern world and books, uh, whether it's nutrition in the brain or um, uh, just all kinds of, of possibilities, uh, trauma in the brain, of course, uh, that's a, a really big one, addiction. Um, addiction is such a, oh, oh gosh, I, I, I'm just so sympathetic to, to people who get caught in those loops and then they can't find peace in order to find their way out um but the brain does recover and and it it takes a while um and essentially recovery at the level of the brain from addiction means it eventually does put out its receptors so that it becomes sensitive again and it is in sensitivity that we find meaning mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so the one last question, like if you had the power uh, to change in the education system about brain health and yeah. more of awareness or right brain living or whole brain living, what yeah. changes would you make to the system so that people, uh, so when we grow children and they naturally become aware, they see yeah. and identify themselves as a 
different version of themselves rather than what we are doing to the world right now where it's more right. left right. skewed yeah whole brain living whole brain living it's actually what i'm already doing i mean i'm taking this book into schools but not for the children mm -hmm. we are right now we are training the adults the teachers the administrators as well as the parents together in the four different parts of the brain and about the brain huddle and how to get your brain to do what you want it to do so that they become much more aware and conscious of how they interact with the children so that the children can actually grow up in a village that is much more kind, much more open, and uh, much more deliberately conscious. Amazing, Jill. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Whoa. Are you working on anything new, new projects, any exciting? You know, to me, to me, actually, we're, we're, uh, we're, we've been waiting for since April uh, to find out about federal funding uh, mm -hmm. to bring whole brain living to uh, literally tens of thousands of schools. Um, and so, so for me, that's, that, that would be a dream come true because then not only do I get to have this experience and awareness of the brain and, and then come back and recover the skill sets of the left, but to be able to share, what did I truly learn about whole brain living and as a society, how we can evolve purposely choose to evolve ourselves to the next level of what we're supposed to be, which is, I believe, whole brain. So, um, so you know, it's a very meaningful existence. And uh, I just feel uh, blessed that uh, I, this, this, is, this has been my ride. Amazing, Jill. Uh, it's, it's a sort of legacy that you're leaving behind. And um, hopefully you, you succeed in all your endeavors. And uh, how can people get in touch with you and find you to learn more about whole brain living and if, if they are to work with you? Yeah. So um, anybody interested in in working with me, I'm Dr. Jill at drjilltaylor.com. I'm very user friendly and um, I do have a, a website. We're transforming it from the commercial of the book, though, to a personal one for who am I in the world? Um, and uh, but yeah, no, I'm very user friendly. Whole brain living. If people are interested in this, I encourage you. Uh, to look at Whole Brain Living, read Whole Brain Living, and then reach out to me and, and we'll see what grows from there. Thank you so much, Raj. Thank you. Well, that was Dr. Jill Taylor explaining the nature of our existence and about the human brain on the Seekers Mind Talks. Hope you all enjoyed the show. If you did, please do support us and do watch our other videos as well. I'm your host, Raj, and until next time, 